All right, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us again uh, for the next session of the second annual mock trial conference. Uh, really excited to have two members of our case committee joining us for an overview um, of the topic of this year's case, which we'll actually be receiving uh, later on today. Uh, you just bear in mind that, um, you know, they're not going to answer specific questions uh, necessarily about like the exact materials in the case, but they're giving you a legal overview of the topic. Um, there will be a case release session later on today where you can ask some of those questions, uh, but others might need to be an errata question or a follow-up question. Um, so uh, just kind of keep it where people can actually read the case prior to asking some of those questions. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand things over to our two presenters today. Uh, feel free to drop your questions in the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat as the session goes on, and there will be a space for questions as well. All right, with that, Daniel and John, take it away. All right, thanks, Ryan. I just need to share my presentation. So if you could bear with me for one second. Okay, can you all see the PowerPoint? I am, okay. And what? Slideshow. All right. Looks like we're good to go. Good to go here. All right. So uh, as the title says, uh, kind of this year's problem is on the takings clause and government regulation. Uh, before we get into it, just a little bit about ourselves. Uh, my name is John Farrell. I'm a business litigator. I practice at Steptoe and Johnson PLLC, which is a West Virginia-based law firm with an office in Columbus, Ohio. And I work in the Columbus, Ohio office. And I'm Daniel Strunk. I uh, am not currently practicing law, but I will be starting November 1st. I'm on some excellent vacation currently. I was previously a law clerk on the Sixth Circuit um, Court of Appeals, and I'll be starting with a plaintiff side firm this November uh, called Keller Linkner that has offices in Chicago and DC. I'll be working out of the DC office. But more importantly for your all's purposes, I was a four-year veteran of the Ohio High School Mock Trial Program. And I actually, I think I'm my memory is correct. I competed on the very last um, takings case that the o OCLRE did. It was an eminent domain case. So this is the next one in the line of, I guess, the Fifth Amendment um, takings uh, clause jurisprudence. So it'll be fun to reflect back upon the Chris Washington um, takings case that, that I did my freshman year. But uh, that's, that's me. I'll throw it back over to John. All right. Yeah, and I actually did not do mock trial in high school. My first exposure to it was uh, as a lawyer, as a judge um, for the competition a couple of years ago. But I did have a friend who did it when we were in high school and he fondly remembers the eminent, that eminent domain case as well. So hopefully this one will be interesting for the students. So uh, I'll start with just a little bit of overview on eminent domain and the takings clause. So, most of you have probably heard the term eminent domain before. This just refers to the government's power to take private property for public use. Um, just a little bit of background and history. So this power actually dates all the way back to the Roman Empire. There are documents that we have that show that there were times when the Roman Empire would appropriate or take private property for public use. Uh, those same documents do indicate that the landowners were compensated when that happened, but uh, this is a very, very old practice and power that has been, that many governments have been recognized to have. Uh, going throughout the Middle Ages and into the colonial times, uh, English monarchs were known to exercise this power as well. And then up until the revolutionary period, uh, getting closer to the revolutionary period, it was more common for parliament at that time to authorize a taking of private property. So they would, uh, they would enact a law that authorized the taking of a particular piece of private property. And then they would determine the amount due to the landowner and the landowner had no say in the process. So that was kind of the state of eminent domain at the time that the, that the United States was formed and at the time that the Constitution and the Bill of Rights were being debated and discussed. So let's 
take a look at the constitutional provision that's going to be issue, at issue here. This is known as the takings clause, and this is in the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution. And it says, quote, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. So it's important to note, by the way this is worded, this isn't granting the power to the government to take private property for public use. It recognizes that that power already exists. And the purpose of the takings clause was actually to limit the government's exercise of that power. And this is consistent with the rest of the Bill of Rights, which is kind of what, what Daniel's gonna talk about here in a second. But I just wanted to point that out before we move for any further. Uh, the, the purpose of the takings clause was not to grant a power, recognize that the power already existed just by the nature of them being a sovereign government. And the purpose of the takings clause was to impose limits on the government's exercise of that power. So I'm gonna flip it over to Daniel and he's gonna talk about the purpose of the takings clause. Before I do that, actually, I'm gonna throw out uh, something that would be helpful, I think for me and, and John as well, maybe in the, in the chat, if anyone could answer for us, maybe Ryan, you could tackle this. Is this the very first time that the people on this call are even learning that the mock trial case involves the takings clause. So this is this was like the big reveal of the uh, case. I'm curious. It was. Um, they got some teasers. Okay. Uh, but we've not right. been very explicit about it exactly what it was. So a lot of it was guessing up until this point. <laughs> okay, that's exciting. This is really exciting, then, guys. Congratulations on officially learning what constitutional problem will be this year's you know thing that the students will study. Very very cool. The takings clause is awesome. Um, so I, I'm going to briefly delve very, very briefly discuss the kind of the motivation maybe behind including the takings clause, not far be it for me to speak on behalf of James Madison and Alexander Hamilton and all the, all the, um, very, very smart people that gathered at the constitutional Congress. And I think it's actually debated amongst legal scholars, what was really the primary motivation, but some of the motivations that have been proposed, it's like, why did they include the takings clause in the constitution. One is a, an idea that it deters government action. So the government will know if it takes, if it uses its power, it already has the power to take your property, but if it uses it, it knows that it will have to pay you for the property it takes. So naturally, if they know they have to pay for what they take, maybe the government will use it less and they'll take less property knowing they'll have to basically pay for what they buy. There's some, I should say, there's some debate about whether it actually deters action because maybe the elected officials don't really care about who's paying for it if they're not the ones, if they're taking property from like a different district than where they're elected from, or so, it gets complicated. But there's a general idea that the government will be less likely to take your property if it actually has to pay for it. Um, a second motivating factor, again, I won't speak as to which one won the day in the eyes of you know James Madison, the rest of the people, the, the convention, but there was an idea that there's fair compensation for people. It's just just. It, it, in the backdrop of what John was talking about, where people's property was taken without the government ever paying for it in previous societies, here there's an idea that if the government takes your property, the founders thought, hey, that's unfair if they just take it without paying you. So there is at least some like economic justice here. You should be able to get money if the government takes what's yours. And then Finally, John hinted at the idea that this limits government action. You know, if there's deterrence, if there's, um, it's it's a prohibition. It, it, well, it's not a prohibition in that the government already has the power to take your property, but it will be, it will, if you believe in the deterrence idea, it will make it less likely that the government will use it. And this kind of abides, uh, use the power to take your property. And this is in keeping in a, a way with all the other amendments in the constitution, not all of them, but nearly all of them prevent the government from acting, right? So a key, one of the key things to know, I guess, for purposes of this case, actually, it will be helpful to keep this in mind. State governments have the police power and the police power means they can do anything within bounds. There are the, the bounds of the federal constitution, the bounds of the state constitution, but the legislature can pass any law to do what it wants within those bounds. Whereas the federal constitution is a government of limited power. So the government can only, the Congress can only pass laws and the president can only do things that have a governmental hook, that have a constitutional hook that allows them to do that thing. And then the Bill of Rights has 
all these things that specifically it says the government can't do these things. So the government can't infringe upon the freedom of speech. The government can't prevent religious practice. The government can't prevent or can't quarter troops within your home or can't seize, do a uh, search and seizure without a warrant and whatnot. And preventing the police or preventing the takings power from being used is in line with these other uh, these other uh, written things in the constitution that prevent the government from acting. Um, so it basically, the purpose behind it is in keeping with a general, maybe skepticism of government authority that might've been very popular um, back at the time of the founding. All right, throwing it back to John. Unmute myself. And uh, yeah, just a quick note here. So uh, for over a hundred years now, it's been recognized that the takings clause, even though it's in the federal constitution, it does also apply to action by state governments. So uh, let's, again, let's, let's go back to the clause itself and think about what it really means. So looking at the text again, it says, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. So we can think of it this way. Uh, if there is a government taking a private property, number one, and that taking is for a public use, number two, if both of those criteria are satisfied, then that means the government is required to pay just compensation for the taking. Now, this year's case is focused only on this first prong. So without getting into the details yet about what, uh, what the problem is, just know that the issue that is gonna be the focus of this year's trial is, was there a government taking of private property? Based on everything we know about what happened, does that constitute a taking by the government of private property? That is what the students are gonna be focused on in their trial. So it's important to understand that because there, there will be some, some things in the case file about, um, about economics and things like that. And so students might be tempted to argue about whether uh, there was just, just compensation or what the amount of the just compensation should be, but that is not the focus of the trial. The main issue for the trial this year is, did a taking occur in the first place? So we just wanna make sure that that's clear uh, from the outset here. So now I wanna talk for a little bit about this year's case, the, what we call as lawyers, the procedural posture. And really all that means is how did we get here? How do we get to this trial that, that we're having? So there's a few legal terms that I'm gonna to try, to, try to cover and try to explain here. One is a writ of mandamus. So what you're gonna see in the case file is that there is a landowner who has filed what is known as a petition for a writ of mandamus. And the legal definition according to Black's Law Dictionary is a writ issued by a court to compel performance of a particular act by a lower court or a governmental officer or body, usually to correct a prior action or failure to act. So I know that's a mouthful. Really all this means is if you as an individual person uh, <clears throat> believe that there is a government body or a government official who has a legal duty to act and they are not performing their duty, you can go to court and, and you can ask the court to issue a writ of mandamus. And what that will do is the court by issuing a writ of mandamus is ordering that government official or that government body to perform its legal duty. So I know it's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a wordy definition and it's an unfamiliar term. Uh, I think lawyers just like to continue using Latin terms to sound smart, but really again, that's, that's all it means. It just means that you're going to court saying that there is a government official who hasn't performed their duty and you're asking the court to order that person to perform their duty. So uh, in the context of a mandamus petition, then the names of the parties are a little bit different than what you would pr have probably seen in a lot of past uh, mock trial problems. So instead of a plaintiff, you have someone who's called the relator. And this is just, this is the person who's initiating the lawsuit. So really for all intents and purposes for mock trial, uh, the relator is just the plaintiff, but you're gonna see them referred to as the relator instead. Uh, and then, on, in a similar vein, instead of defendant, you have the respondent. 
and the respondent is the government official who allegedly is not performing their duty. So again, relator instead of plaintiff, respondent instead of defendant, you're gonna see those terms in the case file. So we want you to know what those mean. So what does this have to do with the takings clause? Well, in the takings clause context specifically, if you are a landowner and you believe that the government has engaged in some kind of action that constitutes a taking of your property for public use, you can file a mandamus petition and you can ask a court to require the government to initiate eminent domain proceedings against your property. So ordinarily, and you know, this, you've probably heard of this in the context of uh, you know, maybe freeway or road expansions or things like that. Ordinarily, when the government wants to exercise its eminent domain power, it institutes the action in court. And then there's going to be a jury trial about how much the property owner should be compensated. But this, this is one step before that. This is if a landowner thinks that a taking has occurred, but the government disputes that or for whatever reason doesn't think that what they've done constitutes a taking in the first place. So the government hasn't filed any action in court and there's, there's, no, uh, there's no forum really for the landowner to say, hey, here's how much I think I should be compensated for for my property because the government doesn't think it was a taking in the first place. If that happens, you as a landowner can go to court and ask for a writ of mandamus. And if you succeed, that is if you convince the court that a government taking of your property has occurred, then the court will issue the writ and it will order the government to institute eminent domain proceedings against your property. And then in a separate hearing, a separate trial, then you'll have a jury trial where the jury decides how much you deserve to be compensated. So in our case, what we have is we have a landowner who has been subjected to some uh, what he believes to be onerous government regulations against his property. And as a result, he thinks that the government has engaged in the taking of his property. The government doesn't agree with that. So just like I explained, he really has no forum to uh, argue uh, what, what, what he should be compensated for this taking because the government doesn't even believe that a taking has occurred in the first place. So what we have in this case is a landowner has asked the court to issue this writ of mandamus. And so what's being tried, what, what the trial in this case is gonna be that the students are focusing on is again, focused on this issue. Did a taking occur? In the real world, if the landowner won this trial, there would be another hearing at a later date where the landowner would get a jury to determine how much he deserved to be compensated for his property. But again, the only thing that we're focusing on here is did a taking occur in the first place? All right. So, uh, oh, sorry, I got one more thing. Oh, my bad. Yeah. John, my, my <laughs> no, <apologies>. you're good. <laughs> so uh, the only other thing is you'll see that there was a motion for, or that there was an order on a motion for summary judgment. And summary judgment is just, this is a procedure that allows a party before trial to have an issue decided as a matter of law before the trial. So you're gonna see that there is an order granting partial summary judgment. And this, this is a common thing that happens in civil litigation where there's a lot of different issues or maybe multiple claims that are being raised. And before the trial, uh, someone will move for summary judgment and then the court decides as a matter of law that one or more of the issues can be knocked out and they, that they don't even need to be tried. So that's what's happened here. And so if you see that, this order for summary judgment, it just means that there were multiple claims raised beforehand and the court has decided that one of them uh, doesn't even need to be tried and will not be the focus of the trial that, that the students will be focusing on. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Daniel to get into some of the nitty gritty of the different categories of government takings. Yeah, so as John did a fantastic job situating us, there have been some regulations that were passed by the state of Buckeye. I think I might have revealed another fact there. State of Buckeye passes some regulations. It affects an individual's ability to run his or her business. And there is no question that the regulations are for public use. So take that off the board. We're not talking about Kilo here versus City of New London, if you're familiar with that case. There's no question about whether 
there should be paid 1 million or 2 million. It's not about the amount of compensation, as John said. All that we're talking about in this year's mock trial case is whether a taking occurred. So since all we're talking about is whether a taking occurred, it probably helps to know what type of takings there are under the law. Um, so that's the categories of takings slide that you see right in front of you. Generally speaking, there are two big categories here. There's physical taking and there's regulatory taking. Now, physical taking is the easy one to describe. It's the one that all of you know in your head. If I were to say name like an example of a government eminent domain taking, you'd probably say like the government needs to build a railroad or they wanna build a public park or something like this. Um, and so they take a, a person's house because it just so happens that the perfect place for this railroad or this highway goes right through your land. So we have to take your house. In that case, it would be a physical taking because the government is literally physically taking your land away from you. You're no longer able to live in your house. They're gonna bulldoze your house and build a railroad. In that um, case, they would pay you the value of your house and the value of your land, and they would be physically taking your property. Um, it can get more complicated than that. The Supreme Court, for those of you who are Supreme Court junkies, the Supreme Court in the last term actually had a very important Supreme Court case where they discussed how a regulation in California, for example, allowed union representatives to go onto people's property to talk to people, um, talk to laborers on, on like agricultural property. And Chief Justice Roberts in an opinion for the court said that that actually was a physical taking because the state of California had passed a law that took from the landowners the ability to exclude people from their property. So the taking of the right to exclude these union organizers amounted to a physical taking. Now, I just went into detail about what a physical taking is in even a Supreme Court case on this. I do that only to give you like background information on the first category of takings. The most important thing to know about physical takings from this presentation is the following. This year's mock trial case does not involve a physical taking. So I just gave you that information to have like a backdrop before we get into arguably the more complicated type of taking that this year's case will involve, which is regulatory taking. So regulatory taking is a taking that is not a physical taking. That's the easiest way to define it, but it also doesn't do much work for you. It's not a physical taking in that they're not physically taking your land away from you to build a railroad, or they're not physically requiring that people enter your land to um, you know, talk to laborers about joining a union. A regulatory taking is different. It's where the government has done something, maybe by passing a regulation, maybe by passing a law, maybe by just a general edict, who knows what the action is, but whatever the action is, the property owner thinks that their property, part of the value of it has been taken away by virtue of what the government has done. Um, a good example of this comes from the very first case that kind of delved into this called Pennsylvania Coal versus, Pennsylvania Coal Company versus Mahan. Um, this is, if you were in law school and you were taking property, the property course, this would be the first court, uh, case you'd read on regulatory taking. I don't think it will be in the materials this year. Ryan can correct me if I'm wrong, but that's only because it's quoted so often in all the other cases that you will get. This is really like the first case. And in this case, to make the facts very simple, there was a guy who owned, or there was the Pennsylvania Coal, Com coal Company, which understandably mined coal. And there was a guy who bought um, basically some land from them in or and he built a house on his land. But the Pennsylvania Coal Company, as part of the sale said, we're selling you this land that you're gonna build a house on but we still get to mine all the coal underneath your house. Fast forward a little bit, the state of Pennsylvania passes a law that says Pennsylvania Coal Company and other companies like it can't um, drill for coal or do whatever it is that the coal companies do to get coal from underneath people's land if it risks um, basically cave-ins that ruin people's houses. So Pennsylvania Coal Company here was like, hey, this law kind of takes away our ability to make money off of our agreement we had with this guy. We already agreed with this guy that we'd be able to mine coal underneath his house. This law takes away our ability to do that. And Justice Holmes, actually, I don't remember if he, I don't think he was Chief Justice. 
Justice Holmes wrote a very good opinion where he had a line in there where he says government action that goes too far can affect a taking. So in this case, the government didn't physically take away Pennsylvania Coal Company's land. It didn't physically take away Mahan's land. All it did was pass a law, but that law that Pennsylvania passed made it so that Pennsylvania Coal Company could not make as much money because it could not drill for coal any longer. So it's not a physical taking, but the government's done something that's taken away a property owner's ability to at least make some money. And so Justice Holmes basically said, if it goes too far, if the police power of the state goes too far, it can affect a taking. And that gave birth to regulatory takings. And I wanna specifically highlight the goes too far line because having done mock trial in the past, I think that this is really a quote that a lot of students could hone in on as like a really um, easy and succinct way to talk about the nub, to talk about what's really the big deal in this year's case. Really this year's case comes down to has the whatever entity Buckeye gone too far so that it needs to pay some money to the person that it's affected. Um, it's way more complicated than that as John is going to get into when he talks about some more finer details of the doctrine of regulatory taking, but that goes too far line is really the crux of it all. So be careful if you quote that because maybe every single team is gonna quote that. But if you wanted one quote that could really capture everything, that's a really good quote to, uh, to hang on to. And I'll throw it over to John to get into the more nitty gritty of the regulatory takings doctrine. Yeah, I agree with that, Daniel. This is a good, uh, a good buzz line here. So, uh, so as Daniel kind of explained, we have, it's been recognized now for almost a hundred years that there's such a thing as a regulatory taking when a government regulation goes too far that it will actually be recognized as a taking of private property for public use. So kind of within this framework of regulatory takings, we have two kind of subcategories. We have total regulatory takings and partial regulatory takings. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about both of those. We'll talk about total regulatory takings first. So uh, the kind of leading case on this issue is this case called Lucas versus South Carolina Coastal Council. Uh, as you can see from the picture here, this case involved somebody who owned beachfront property in South Carolina. He purchased property that was undeveloped. So it was a, it was a vacant lot on the South Carolina beachfront for almost a million dollars. And just a few years after he purchased the property, before he was able to build a house on it, the state of South Carolina enacted a law that was intended to prevent the erosion of its coastline. And this law effectively prevented this property owner from building a house on his property. So as you can imagine, someone who's just spent almost a million dollars on this property with the clear intention to build a beach house that he can live in and rent out and make money on um, would not be happy about this, uh, this deprivation of really all of the value of his property. I mean, he bought it specifically for that purpose. And this government, this, this new law by the state government now prevents him from doing it. So the Supreme Court actually ended up agreeing with him. The Supreme Court said, when the owner of real property has been called upon to sacrifice all economically beneficial uses in the name of the common good, that is to leave his property economically idle, he has suffered a taking. So uh, again, we're talking about a total regulatory taking here. And so that word all is important. It has to deprive the property owner of all economically beneficial uses of their property. You're gonna see in the case file, uh, you know, I talked just a little bit about summary judgment. There's gonna be an order in the case file granting summary judgment to the government entity on this issue. And basically what that means is that the landowner argued when he filed his original petition, he argued that the government regulation was a total regulatory taking. But before the trial, the court decided that, well, no, it didn't deprive you of all of the value of your property. So it's, it's not a total regulatory taking. You don't have this claim. So again, as Daniel said, for the uh, physical taking, category. Uh, really, the only thing you need to know about total regulatory takings 
for purposes of this year's problem is that it's not an issue for the trial. Uh, again, we're just kind of giving you some background because these concepts come up in the case law that's being provided as part of the file. So we want you to know what it's talking about when courts are, are talking about total regulatory or partial regulatory taking. But for purposes of this year's problem, uh, there was not a total regulatory taking. The court has already conclusively determined that before we even get to trial. So what is this case about? This case is about a partial regulatory taking. So partial, as you may have guessed, is when there's a regulation that does not deprive somebody of the total value of their property, but nevertheless, uh, it adversely impacts the value of the property enough that it constitutes a taking of the property by the government. So the seminal case on this from the US Supreme Court is known as Pennsylvania Central Transportation Company versus New York City. Uh, that picture there is a picture of Grand Central Station in New York. And uh, in this case, the owner of Grand Central Terminal was this private company, Pennsylvania Central Transportation Company. And New York City had recently enacted an ordinance that uh, designated certain buildings, including this one, as historical landmarks. And for the purpose of protecting these landmarks from being, uh, you know, defaced or demolished or, or substantially altered, in preserving uh, these historical buildings. Certain landowners, including this owner, were prohibited from developing their property in a certain way. Particularly this owner, what they wanted to do was they wanted to build office space on top of Grand Central Terminal. And this ordinance prevented them from doing that. So they went to court and they argued that this was, even though it didn't deprive them of all of the value of their property, like the beachfront property owner in the case we just talked about, that's still a pretty uh, significant impact on their ability to develop and, and make money on this property. I mean, think about this is in a prime location in Manhattan and they were not allowed to build office space on top of this building. You're talking about millions and millions and millions of dollars potentially lost in income there. And so uh, in this case, what the court said was, if something like that happens, even if someone isn't deprived of all of the value of their property, it might still be a taking. And there's some factors that you have to look at to determine whether it's a taking. So the court said the economic impact of the regulation on the property owner, in particular, the extent to which the regulation is interfered with distinct investment-backed expectations are of course relevant considerations. So too is the character of the governmental action. So really what we have here is we have this, this very fact-specific kind of multi-factor analysis that needs to be done in order to determine whether a partial regulatory taking has occurred. So what we're gonna talk about next is we're gonna kind of dive into these, what we call the Penn Central factors. So those three factors outlined in this case, and that's really gonna be the bread and butter of this year's mock, mock trial case. All the evidence that the students put on and all of the arguments that they make really should be geared towards these three factors and how the evidence fits into these factors and what the conclusion should be as a result. So I'm now going to turn it back over to Daniel to begin our talk about uh, our kind of deeper dive into these Penn Central factors. Yeah, so the first factor, which is the one I'll be uh, getting into before throwing it back to John is probably the easiest to explain and the most straightforward to, um, to just in general for anyone to understand. And probably you would wanna start with this one with your students, not just because it's first, but because it's the easiest to describe. It's just how much economic impact is the regulation, the law, whatever is the government action, how much of an economic impact does it have on the business owner here. In this case, it is a business, in our mock trial case, it is a business owner. So how much impact does the state of Buckeye's action have on this business owner? Is it taking away 90% of the profit that they would make? 80%, 20%, you know, what, what is the um, percentage of the income of the opportunity for growth, whatever, 
that is being taken away from the business owner. That's the bread and butter of the first um, first first question, the first factor. But keep in mind here, you can have fun with developing this in the mock trial case because you could probably deal with expert opinions. You can get into lay person's um, sense of how business is going. There's any number of ways you can gather facts that you could then weave into a compelling closing argument section about how the economic impact of the law is really taking away the majority of the profit of the business owner. Um, so that's the most straightforward one, but it's also might be the most fun one, depending upon how you approach the case with your witnesses, because you can go all sorts of avenues there. Throwing it back over to John for the other two uh, factors in the in the test. All right, thanks, Daniel. So the second one, what does this mean? Interference with investment backed expectations. That's a language only a lawyer could love right there in my opinion. Really all this means to boil it down is what I have shown in the picture there. Was the rug pulled out from under this owner? Uh, that's that's really kind of, to simplify it, that's, that's what we're asking here uh, when, when you're looking at this prong of the analysis. Um, as one, Federal Court of Appeals put in, and I think they, this is really well stated. It says, the reasonable investment-backed expectation analysis is designed to account for property owners' expectation that the regulatory regime in existence at the time of their acquisition of the property will remain in place and that new, more restrictive legislation or regulations will not be adopted. So again, just to, <laughs> to simplify what that means, it really just means the rug getting pulled out from under you. So when you bought the property, what kinds of regulations on your business and on that type of property and that type of business were already in place? That's one question to ask. At the time he acquired the property, what kind of regulation was should he have expected? Um, is the regulation that's at issue here, is that a significant departure from the regulations that were already in place when he bought the property? Again, that's that idea of the rug being pulled out from under him. Uh, who, you know, what did he expect when he bought the property? What additional regulations would a reasonable person in the place of the property owner be expecting when he bought the property? Uh, and on kind of a related note, what industry is the property owner involved in? So, uh, for example, the owner of a gun store has a lot more reason to expect strict government regulation of their business than someone who owns a candy store, for example. So you have to think about what kinds, what kind of business or what kind of industry the property owner is in. And as a result of that, what kinds of regulations can they be expecting the government to impose on them? And then finally, you can, and these are just kind of, this isn't, an exhaustive list of questions. These are just kind of to get the creative juices flowing as far as what uh, what kind of evidence you would want to look for to go to this factor. But what what was the cause of the new regulations being enacted? Was the property owner aware of the problem that led to this regulation at the time they purchased the property? Or is this something that just came completely out of left field and was not expected when they bought the property? So those are just some specific questions to kind of guide the analysis. But again, I just want you to go back, think the students should really just be thinking about this as, is it unfair for a property owner at the time that he bought the property, would it, was it fair for him to expect that this kind of regulation would be in place or was the rug pulled out from under him? That's really what this factor is focused on. And then finally, we'll talk about the character of the governmental action. So what's the purpose of the regulation? Um, since you guys are gonna be hearing the scenario soon, uh, I'm, I'm dropping just another not so subtle hint here. Uh, we see this sign about uh, a mask requirement for entering a place of business. So uh, what you'll see in the case law is that if the purpose of the regulation is for protecting public health and safety, then the government has a lot more leeway in, um, in what they're allowed to do and it not being considered a taking. So that's one, one kind of sub factor of this character of the government action factor of the analysis is what, what was the purpose of the regulation? The other side though, you can ask, has the property owner been singled out 
they've been unfairly singled out. So uh, if you have this regulation that's sort of neutrally and widely applicable to the entire population, it's a lot different than if the government decides to target a particular industry or a particular class of businesses or class of people. So if, if there's a singling out that you can see, or if even within a certain industry, there are certain property owners that are being treated more favorably than others, that is relevant to this analysis. And then finally, how long is the regulation going to be in place? So if something is temporary, it's much less likely to be considered a taking of private property because by its very nature, it's not going to be in place permanently. But uh, students should, should think pretty hard about this when they look at the facts in the case file here. Specifically, uh, what makes something temporary? So if there's no definite end in sight, can you really say that it's temporary? Uh, if you have a regulation that is doesn't say that it's permanent, but also doesn't say when it's going to be lifted, can you really characterize that as a temporary regulation? That's something the students should be thinking about when they when they look at the facts here. So again, uh, we got I didn't put a slide for this, but again, you've got the three Penn Central factors. You have the economic impact. You have the interference with investment backed expectations, which is just, was it fair to him expect for, for the property owner to expect that this would happen or did they have the rug pulled out from under them? And then you have the character of the government action, which in and of itself has a number of different facts and, and factors to consider. So that's all I have. I'm just gonna throw it back to Daniel for one final note and then we will open the floor for questions if anyone has any. Amazing. So one final note, um, and this is, I, I guess this would only be relevant insofar as you could make some fun arguments if it weren't for the case that this one final note has been taken away from you. So if you are a high school mock trial coach out there who really likes getting into the nitty gritty of the case law to find like a narrow, fun, unique argument that no one else will see and try to like baffle the minds of the judges with this argument and win by virtue of that. Here's at least one that you cannot do um, because it's it's been taken away from you from, I, I believe, something contained within the case. But it makes for a fun little final note. And the final note is the Supreme Court of the United States has yet to explicitly address the question, um, if a state uses its police power to enact restrictions on business owners to protect public health in the wake of COVID-19, because I feel John has revealed that, that fact from our case, it involves a COVID-19 restrictions passed by Buckeye. So the Supreme Court has not answered the question, if a state uses its police power to enforce restrictions against business owners to protect the public from COVID-19 or the spread of COVID-19, is that um, a de facto not a taking? Just like we're taking that not taking, we're removing that from the category of government action that states can do that constitute a taking. Um, that is an open question. The state of New Mexico, for example, the Supreme Court of New Mexico in a case that I, I believe you will be getting in your case law for the case problem has said, they had a case and they basically said, if governments pass neutrally applied, I think, neutrally applied restrictions on business owners, so you can't like say, this business owner has to abide by these restrictions and every single other business owner is exempt. But if this, the state of New Mexico said, if like all the businesses in New Mexico or all the businesses in this locality face the same restrictions to prevent COVID-19 from being spread, that is in and of itself taken out of the category of government action that can be a taking. We're just, that's so important for public health. That's so crucial and significant. We cannot basically hinder the state's ability or locality's ability to respond to pandemics by requiring them to pay every single business owner that a regulation might affect. Um, so New Mexico, the Supreme Court of New Mexico said that. The case is included within the case problem. I think Ryan can confirm that. The case itself is called State versus Wilson, but that is not a binding case within the Ohio mock trial problem. And moreover, within the Ohio mock trial problem, I believe it's been taken out of consideration 
whether or not the police power is de facto um, justified in the context of a pandemic restriction. That we're really just narrowing in only on the regulatory takings doctrine, partial regulatory takings, and under those three um, categories, the three factors basically, does it amount to a regulatory taking? Um, the Supreme Court of the United States might decide that issue that I've just talked about very briefly this term. And they could say COVID-19 or not, if a state government passes an action that under the Penn Central factors leads to like a huge amount of profit being taken away from a company, they have to pay for it. They could go out that way, or they could go the way the Supreme Court of New Mexico did and say, if it's for COVID-19 or for a pandemic, you can't hinder the government, a state government's ability to respond. We don't know what will happen, but the important thing to know is not at issue in this year's mock trial case, even though it's very, um, I think, probably one of the more interesting issues the Supreme Court might uh, discuss and debate this term. Um, so that's one final note. I'll add a second final note, which is if over the course of this presentation, you've said to yourself, wow, what an amazing PowerPoint. That was all John's doing. I want to give him entire credit for that, which I did at multiple times say, wow, what a great PowerPoint. So I want to throw that over and make sure he gets all the credit for that. But we will now be happy to answer any questions that you might have for us. Um, and John, how do you want to handle this? Or, or Ryan, do you have thoughts as to how um, we should go about answering questions via chat or I guess uh, verbally or whatnot? John, I welcome any thoughts you have here. Sure. Yeah. So I think we can just kind of follow the, I mean, and, and again, you know, John, feel free to weigh in. No worries. Uh, feel free to weigh in if, if you want to do it differently, but we can, I think, do the same way we've been doing it so far of just drop them in the chat. Uh, or if you're you know, feeling adventurous and brave, you can also unmute uh, and ask your question uh, on, on camera. I'll unshare so that we can see people. And just to resolve some things, I guess, that have come up. Um, yeah, so th they do have uh, State v. Wilson in their uh, materials. Um, but as you mentioned, you know, it's not, it's not binding precedent. Um, so, you know, the the arguments listed in there don't necessarily uh, dismiss uh, this year's case. So. I can say as an aside, right, you know, that there'll be the case presentation coming up here in a little bit. Um, you know, every year we say that, you know, okay, I think we've, we've done the most complicated case we can possibly make. And then the next year it's more complicated. Um, I really do think this year is just the ultimate complicated case. I don't know how it gets more complicated than partial regulatory takings. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a whopper in terms of complication and technicality. <laughs> Yeah. And the label, frankly, the labels don't really help. I, mean, I think the like partial regulatory taking sounds more complicated than I think that quote from Justice Holmes, where it's like, has the government action gone too far? So if you were to explain this to your students, I'd really start with that quote rather than get into like defining partial regulatory takings and total regulatory. That sounds way more scary than just saying like the government might do something that makes it harder for you to use your property in a profitable way. Got a great question uh, from Jessica Fairchild, Fairchild about um, temporary regulatory takings, right? So, you know, particularly in this case, right, knowing that a lot of the restrictions going in place are in fact temporary, uh, you know, what have the court said up to this point about takings that are not permanent or regulations that are not permanent that might affect a taking? I could speak on that and Daniel can chime in if you, um... I don't, I don't have the name of the case in front of me, but I, I know that there are a few cases out there and that this is kind of what I was alluding to when I was saying, you know, think about what temporary really means. So temporary in its strictest sense means it has a definite end date. So uh, as we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic is kind of indefinite at this point. Um, we don't know when all these restrictions are gonna be lifted. So uh, there are some cases out there that imply that uh, e even if it's not permanent in name, that if a restriction doesn't have, if there's no end in sight, there's no light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak, uh, it might be considered a permanent regulation for purposes of this analysis. Um, 
I've learned with regard to the law, especially when you have to brief a judge on a legal issue, it's always best to say, I don't know, or at least cabin the areas that you don't know, rather than leave it open that the judge might later find a case that totally shows that what you told him or her was incorrect. So I'll say, I don't know about whether a Supreme Court case or a Ohio Supreme Court case or whatever has spoken to whether a temporary um, timeline can amount to a, a ban on a partial regulatory takings analysis. I think no is my gut instinct. I do know that there is a Supreme Court case that says that if the government has a temporary action, it cannot be a physical taking. So if there's a temporary thing that might take away your right to exclude someone from your property, there's a Supreme Court case that says a temporary um, government intrusion cannot be a physical taking. But remember, this year's case does not involve physical takings. It only involves uh, regulatory takings. So I think the temper, I agree totally with John. If the, if the, hot, uh, the time horizon is such that who knows if it will ever go away, the restrictions, or if the timeline is such that the business won't be here in five years and three years and two years because it can't afford to continue to operate, that would seemingly still leave some room for a partial regulatory takings claim, I think, with the caveat again, that I don't know the totality of all the law in existence on this. I do know within the closed universe of the cases you're provided, you should be safe with regard to the, the temporary versus permanent um, situation. I just don't wanna to speak to the law generally outside of the case law of Ohio mock trial and give you bad information. And I think, I mean, to that point, right, I, I would add, I guess, you know, based on what is in the case file itself, the case law that exists, you know, in, in our closed body, um, you know, the temporary versus permanent, right, it's also, it's another thing that helps you to distinguish amongst the factors, right? Like those three Penn Central factors really are what so much of this comes down to. And the temporary versus permanent is one of the facts that you can use in those factors, Right. Because ultimately, you know, there, there's, there's not just a situation of whether or not, um, you know, the regulation created a taking to begin with, but also is it a compensable taking, right? You know, no one's going to argue that money, you know, wasn't lost as a result of restrictions. But the question becomes, you know, is that one for which the government owes you just compensation? And so figuring out if the taking has occurred because it's regulation that's going into place, all of these you know, kind of questions about the duration of the regulation and the impact that it had on the business owner, both of those go into the analysis of the Penn Central factors and just kind of figuring out um, you know, whose favor those three factors uh, you know, lean toward. Yeah, and to piggyback off of that a little bit, if you're trying to explain this to your students, maybe a good example to give them would be zoning laws. So under the Penn Central factors, zoning laws, another way to put this is zoning laws across the country have not been found to be uh, takings by governments that require compensation under Penn Central. If Penn Central were so strong that it meant a run of the mill ordinary zoning law that says like this area has to be residential, this area has to be commercial, whatever. If that amounted to a taking and the government had to pay money for all of the possibilities that that opened up, governments would be paying money all the time. And maybe some people would really love that. Maybe when some people like the, the idea that the government can have zoning, but zoning is kind of seen as like, maybe it affects the ability of people to use their property, but it's definitely not a taking as long as it's neutrally applied and not targeted at a specific property owner. So that's like a case, an example you can use to describe to your students government actions that are definitely not takings, but on a spectrum where like at some point you go beyond just generic zoning where you're really, really harming a property owner from being able to survive. And survive or use their property, I shouldn't say survive, like being able to use their property to make any money at all. Um, there was a good question. Uh, question about, um, so regulatory takings, does it restrict a company's ability to do its job entirely or a component of its job? Like, how does that matter? Or I guess, how does that work through this? Um, that's something I'd imagine that can be argued both ways. So if you're representing the, the landowner here or the, the, the business owner, you might want to say, 
we've been doing this business for a long time. We've looked into other ways we can make money while these restrictions are placed upon us. We really can't do it. We like can't, our profits are cratering. Um, and in that way, it's not just like, you want to make it look really bad. Like you are, are barely able, the company's barely able to survive. And maybe that you can do that by saying the core component of our job, we can't do it anymore. Um, or, but maybe, but I wouldn't go so far as to say that it has to be every single thing you could ever do to make any form of money is not available to you anymore. Because that sounds a lot like the Lucas um, total regulatory taking situation where you can make no money anymore. Really, it's the idea that this has gone too far where um, you're just pr under the three factors. And if this sounds fuzzy wuzzy, it's because the, the three factors leave a lot of, it's very fact intensive. Um, it's, but I, to give you a very clear answer to your question, no, it does not require all the entire, the ability to do its job entirely. It could be that a core component of our job we can't do anymore. And that affects like 90% of our sales or something. And under Penn Central, that might amount to a regulatory taking. John, do you agree with me on that? That, that one was a hard question. Yeah, I do. And I, I guess I'll just uh, add one more thing to kind of clarify um, not that you were unclear, but uh, okay, I probably was. Just to, to further clarify, um, part of the reason that we that we picked this kind of a scenario is because it just gives so much room to argue both sides, and it's because uh, when you have a kind of just it, it, on any legal issue, when you have this kind of what we call a multi-factor analysis, it's because nobody has said set down any kind of bright line rule where in this situation, it will always be a taking or this will always not be a taking. So uh, we made it arguable, obviously on purpose. And so uh, it's, yeah, I guess I just don't wanna say one way or the other, whether that's definitely true or definitely not true because that's, that's one of the things that really the students should be arguing about. Yeah, and there's a line in a lot of the cases that is quoted often, it seems, when I was just reading the case law on this, that regulatory takings are fact-intensive inquiries. There's like that quote, fact-intensive inquiries, and you'll see that over and over. And that's really because it is a fact-intensive inquiries. There aren't as many bright line rules. And in, a good example of this is there was a Supreme Court case that involved a person who owned property in Wisconsin. And there was a question as to, there were two lots, and there was a question as to whether you counted his property as one lot or the like two different lots. Like, how do you decide? Because depending upon the taking, if it's the whole lot, then the taking is, might be 100% of the lot. But if it's two lots, it might be a small. So there's even cases that delve into the fr like the fractional nature of this. Now, thankfully, you don't have to worry about that because this doesn't involve the taking of any land. It's just like a regulatory issue. And again, if there's another quote you want to, hone in on with your students, it would be the fact intensive inquiry nature of this, where you're probably going to have dueling economic experts testifying or dueling witnesses testifying about how much profit or how much, how many customers, whatever have been lost and what percentage of the total business has been lost and things like that. Well, and, and one other thing I'll just add to that is that, you know, really at the end of the day, this kind of comes down to fairness. Um, I mean, you've got all these all these factors that you're looking at and stuff, but think about, I mean, so on one hand, is it really fair to make the government pay for these kind of public health regulations? But on the other hand, is it really fair for a, a private business owner to have his business essentially uh, destroyed or you know, like really not able to carry on his business as a result? So that's, um, yeah, just something else to keep in mind, maybe another potential source of argument for the students. I think it's helpful to remember, right, like, this is a good opportunity for us to kind of go back to the real people, real stories concept, right? I think, you know, particularly in law school, right, in legal arguments, we, we get lost in the technicalities of cases, what the rules are that are coming out of it, or, you know, the importance of a decision, but we forget that there's a real person behind what's happening, right? And so if you look at the case law that's included, I mean, even if we take Penn Central itself, right, if you watch the way that the case kind of, you know, the, the court parses through the idea, they're looking at the actual business that Penn Central was trying to run and figuring out the extent to which the regulation impacted them, right? So in terms of like, does it have to be all of your business or part of your business? 
I mean, Penn Central still ran a railroad, right? They still had money coming through Grand Central Terminal. It was still an active working train station. So it's not like because of the regulation that New York passed, all of a sudden their, you know, their income is now zero, right? It's that the regulation had a significant financial impact on other parts of their business that they could, you know, could have pursued like that, you know, that development. That's not to say that in every single case is going to come out that same way, you know, to John's point earlier, that's a multi-million dollar loss that they're suffering because of this brand new regulation. But, you know, the court could have just as easily looked at that, gone through all the factors, weighed through all of the facts that were in evidence and said, nah, in this instance, we don't think it's a taking. Therefore, you know, we're, we're not going to um, order any compensation, you know, occur. Other thoughts, questions, comments? This is always the awkward part of presenting on Zoom, right? I feel like in person, everyone's a lot more willing to, you know, chime in and ask questions. Uh, you know, but I know obviously this is a lot to take in, right? This is a very, very complicated issue. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, our two presenters, John, Daniel, I think you guys made this as straightforward as it possibly can be. And that is a super hard undertaking. So, uh, you know, truly, truly um, you know, the, the, the best people for the job. No problem. Thank you so much. And again, I want to throw as much of the credit as I can to John I'm pointing at he's right next to me on my screen, at least um, for putting together the outline and the PowerPoint that I think can be made available to all the teachers watching this if they want it. And Ryan can fill you in on how to get it. Absolutely. Um, and I, I can I can reveal right that it's a restaurant uh, in this year's case. We're talking about a restaurant. So uh, so no, it is it is not the snack bar at Trillium High School, uh, that <laughs> first institution, uh, but it is a restaurant that is going to be uh, impacted by the regulations. All right. Well, with that, then uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, stop the recording. As I mentioned, this will go out to all of our uh, teachers, all of our registrants later on today. Feel free to share this with your students, uh, because I think this is one of the most straightforward explanations of this topic you could possibly find. Um, and it's a heck of a lot easier than trying to teach it to them from scratch, uh, you know, in the front of the room during our practice. Uh, so this will be made available to you and also to your students later on today.